So good evening, everyone. I'm Hannah, Assistant Director at the Blue Hill Library. And I just wanted to say a quick hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining us this evening from wherever you are. Uh, we're gonna be recording tonight's program. So uh, if you miss part of it or you wanna share it later, I'll send out the link to that as well, um, probably tomorrow. And we're very happy tonight to have Rich McDonald here to share with us about his new book, which is called Little Big Year, Chasing Acadia's Birds. Rich is a field biologist, an ornithologist, a naturalist, tour guide, writer, photographer, um, he does it all. And he's right across the water from us in Bar Harbor. He also runs the Natural History Center, leading nature tours uh, around Acadia. And he's going to be sharing uh, some images and some thoughts tonight from his book. And um, we have you know, time at the end for questions, but also if questions come up during the presentation, feel free to use the chat feature, type them into the chat, and then I can uh, jump in with Rich and uh, shout them out as we go as well. So over to you, Rich. Great. Well, thank you, Hannah. This is, I'm really excited to be doing a presentation for you guys. Uh, um, it's, it's kind of, I'm still adapting. I don't do a lot of Zooming, but I do a little bit. And so I'm, I'm getting used to doing these presentations not in person. So this is, this is great. Um, and I, I love the Blue Hill Library because when I was on the board of Down East Audubon for 10 years, we regularly met in your conference rooms. So I know your library well. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my book and I held it up, I'll hold it up again. Here it is, Little Big Year, Chasing Acadia's Birds. And I have to say, it's been a life goal of mine ever since I was quite young to write a book. And I never quite got there. I've written many magazine articles and scientific journal articles. I've written chapters in books, but never wrote a book. And then uh, in 2018, well, 2017 leading up to 2018, I realized 2018 is a big year in many ways in the world of birds, it's a big year. It was the 100th anniversary of the Migratory, Birdie, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And it's one of our seminal pieces of environmental legislation in the US and still is today. Um, and then because of that anniversary, Cornell Lab of Ornithology partnered with National Geographic Magazine and decided to call it the year of the bird. And so National Geographic, each issue during that year had articles about birds. And that was a very exciting year for me. To, I've subscribed to National Geographic forever and, and to see every issue you know, with bird articles was great. Um, and then here in Maine, it was an exciting year because that was the launch of the five-year Maine Breeding Bird Atlas. And I'm one of the regional coordinators for it. Um, and it's a really cool project. And I'm not gonna talk too much about that. If you're intrigued with it, uh, basically we're trying to get people to report their breeding bird observations you don't have to see the bird on the nest, but there are bird behaviors that indicate breeding behavior. We're also trying to get them to document birds during the winter. So if you're interested in doing that, um, you can Google uh, Maine Bird Atlas and you'll find the website and you'll find more information. And you're also welcome to email me um, or contact me or, or anybody in the Maine Bird Atlas and, and learn more about it. But we'll, we'll move on from there. So with all of those, those features, the, the 100th anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the, the fact that it was the uh, year of the bird and the launch of the bird atlas, I said, I'm gonna do something big to celebrate this. I'm gonna do my own big year. And in the world of birding, some of you might know what a big year is. Um, there was a book that was actually, I found a really good book called The Big Year by Mark Obamsik. And he wrote about three birders who spent a year combing North America to find as many birds as they could. And, and that was turned into a movie called by the same name, The Big Year, starring Jack Black, Owen Wilson, and Steve Martin. And with that trio, you know it's a funny movie. And so often movies start and they'll say things like, you know, uh, this movie inspired by actual events or this movie based on actual events. And, and this movie started that way too. This movie is based on, an, on real events. Only the facts have been changed. And, so you know it's 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 fictional and it's funny, but um, but it was it's it really kind of brought I think it brought birding to the big screen in, in a way that maybe it never had been there before. But that idea of birding with a big year was to do this continent wide big year. You travel at a moment's notice by plane to wherever the rare bird shows up, 
And in today's digital age, it's really easy to keep track of all of the rare birds. Um, you know, you would drive inordinate amounts of miles in cars and flying and spend huge amounts of money, money that I can't even envision spending in, to go birding for a year, let alone over my life. Um, so I, I wanted to do a big year, but I wanted to do it on a smaller scale. And I thought, well, I could do it statewide. And a friend of mine, Doug Hitchcock from Maine Audubon did that when he graduated college. And he drove, I forget what the number was, it was something like 65,000 miles in a year birding in Maine. So I don't wanna do that either. And I wanna get, you know, bring it, bring it in closer. I said, I'm gonna do Hancock County. And Hancock County, uh, it just seemed like a good geographic limit for my big year. So now I have my, my limit, my geographic limit, I'm gonna do the year 2018. And um, then the next question was, how many birds should I try to get? Um, you know, I've, I've gone birding on a really good day here just on MDI in Mount Desert Island. I've gone birding in a day and seen a hundred, I think my best day was maybe like 112 species. Like, okay, so more than that. Um, and I took my checklist of birds and you know, this foldable checklist of the birds at MDI that I put together and, and said, you know, look through them. What birds am I likely to get? And I wanted to be fairly conservative. So I, I decided to go with 225 as my limit, excuse me. Um, so I, I decided you know, that was my goal to get 225 birds confined to Hancock County. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of you on the screen here, I recognize the names and know that many of you are local. I don't know if everybody is local here, but, but just in case some of you are not. Um, so Hancock County is 85 miles north to south, um, offshore, 25 miles offshore is Mount Desert Rock, that's in Hancock County. And that's owned by College of the Atlantic. And I'm an, uh, an adjunct faculty there. So I, uh, you know, I get out to the rock pretty often. And then going north up near Orono, we've got the Sunk Hayes Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and so we've got to the north, we've got some, uh, some nice boreal habitat, this Northern forest type habitat. And then the county is about 45 miles wide um, from the east where you've got, you know, kind of between uh, the, the Skudik Peninsula and Petit Manan Peninsula, and then going west to the Penobscot River to, to Orland and Bucksport area. So it's a big area. And I figured that, okay, I, that's, that's, that's reasonable. I can go and, you know, in the course of a year, I can hit all kinds of part, all different communities and habitats and see the birds and see how many birds I can get. Um, and, and I'll go out birding for the day. And then after a day of birding, any bird that's new for the year for me, I will sit and write the story of that bird, um, my finding the bird. And, and I've spent a lot of my life studying birds. I, I started banding birds when I was 10. Um, and I've been studying birds ever since. So I've got a lot of life experiences with a lot of these birds. And in my family, I'm kind of a storyteller. And I decided I'm gonna write this book in my storytelling voice. I wanted it to be something that not just birders would wanna read, but hopefully anybody just has an interest in natural history. So that was kind of my guideline for what am I gonna do and how am I gonna do it? So um, um, I, I, you know, I started the year and my first day, which uh, was January 1st as everybody's year is, but I, uh, my first day is a tradition I've been doing for about 15, almost 20 years is doing the Scudic Christmas bird count. So New Year's day and the last bunch of years I've been joining my friend Don Lima and his son Kyle so maybe what I'll do is I'll start by reading just a brief bit from that to give you a, a flair for kind of my writing style in the book here. So New Year's Day, eight o'clock a.m. I hit the snooze button one too many times. Man, do I need more sleep. The Scooter Christmas bird count is always junior, January 1st, the very first day of the new year. For me, New Year's Eve is a time for celebration. A group, group of my friends drink a few drinks, play a few games, this year, we were introduced to a dice game called Fargo and solve the nation's problems. Hmm, sounds like a typical night at the Thirsty Whale and stay up well past midnight. I'm supposed to meet Don Lima and his 20 year old son, Kyle at Winter Harbor in an hour. I need a shower to clear the cobwebs from my head. Have to gather binoculars and camera and spotting scope, put together a day's worth of food and drive 40 minutes to the Winter Harbor IGA, our previously agreed upon meeting place. 
The thermometer outside my home office window reads a bitter minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit. This is going to be a cold one. Cold on the coast of Maine is not like cold in the Adirondack Mountains of Northern New York, where I spent 20 years. There, on a 6 million acre outcrop of the Canadian Shield, temperatures can plunge to minus 20 Fahrenheit during the winter. Cold, yes, but surprisingly, not as biting when it lacks the humidity to sap your heat. Here in Maine, we can rely on Arctic north winds traveling unhindered over long fetches of open salt water. All this water guarantees high relative humidity, a dampness that further saps heat from any exposed flesh or areas not covered by enough clothing. Sometimes even seeming as though it will suck out your soul. So I've set the tone, we're off for a year of birding and Don and Kyle and I drove around and, and dialed in, in Don's truck and saw birds. And the very first bird while we were in the Winter Harbor IGA was a black capped chickadee flew past and they have a distinctive flight. And, and when I'm out birding with people, I'm always, you know, people say like, oh my God, how did you identify that bird? You gotta remember, I've been doing this for more than 40 years and you do anything long enough. Think about what each of your professions are, each of your passions in life. And I'm sure if we went through the, each and every one of you that are in attendance here, we could find something where you're so good at that any one, other one of us would say, oh my God, how do you do that? Or how do you know that? It's because if we're passionate about it, we spend our lives doing these things and we get, you get good at it when you spend enough time doing it. So there goes a chickadee flying across the parking lot. And so the three of us know what it is. Um, so that was the, the very first bird of our Christmas bird count. And as the day went on, we started to tick off other birds and tick off not meaning upset, but to, um, but this is kind of bird or slang form, you know, marking our checklist. We've, we've ticked them on our checklist or we've ticked them off. Um, you'll, like any, any, um, any vocation or avocation, you've got your own jargon. And there's a few other bits of jargon I'll use that you might find entertaining as I'm doing my talk here. So we saw, uh, again, back to the chickadee though, chickadees to me, like it was a great way to start the bird. Uh, chickadees, in, in general, the generic term chickadee, it's the state of Maine bird. They didn't say black cap chickadee or boreal chickadee, they just said chickadee. Um, and so, so we started the day with the state's bird. And, and I always liked the chickadee. I think of the chickadee as Norm from that 80s TV show Cheers. And you know, many of you have bird feeders and you see the chickadees come into the feeder. And I would swear from watching, from years of watching chickadees, all the other birds like chickadees. The chickadee comes in and they all, the other birds to anthropomorphize, they're saying norm, which is, you know, or the, the, the avian equivalent of norm. And they're happy the chickadee's there. So uh, the chickadee comes in, the chickadee's feeding, everybody's happy. The chickadee's doing his little chickadee thing, chickadee, chickadee, dee, dee. They're happy, everybody else is happy. But I also think of chickadees as a bit of a sentinel and they're always, they seem to be hyper vigilant, looking around, what birds are around, what, are there any predators? Do we need to worry about any predators? And there's been some studies done. Um, I, I have been saying for years, oh, a few years ago, there was an article in the Journal of Field Ornithology. I think a few years ago now is more like 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and so this article talked about communication, interspecies communication with the, the black capped chickadee and other species that, that move about and mix foraging flocks with them. So species like the, uh, Golden Crown Kinglet, the Ruby, um, the uh, Rose Red Breasted Nuthatch, the Brown Creeper, the Hairy and Downy Woodpeckers. So these birds will move through the canopy, especially in the winter, feeding together. And the chickadees just, you know, kind of garrulously talking away. But when they start doing a lot of D's, chickadee D D D D D, you know that there's danger, and all the other birds know there's danger. And so the study in the Journal of Field Ornithology found that you can gauge the level of danger to a chickadee by the number of Ds. More Ds means more danger. And if it's dangerous to a chickadee, it's dangerous to all the other little birds flirt, uh, flitting around with them. And when I'm doing kids programs, I love asking, telling them that, and they all start going chickadee, dee, dee. Um, and then I say, what's dangerous to a chickadee? And this could be kids, you know, kind of kindergarten age, right through high school. And almost without exception, somebody will say bald eagle. Now, some of you know a little bit more about birds than others. But think about this, where do chickadees hang out? They're in the forest, they're in, in, in sheltered areas. They're not in the wide open. And bald eagles are a bird of the wide open. 
It could be the a wide open above the forest. It could be the wide open above the ocean, uh, but it's not in the forest flying through like a goshawk. So, um, so a bald eagle is not a threat to a chickadee, but that northern goshawk, if that's near the feeder, that is definitely a danger to the chickadee. Cats are dangers, and even things like squirrels can be a danger um, during, especially during the nesting season. Squirrels and deer have been known any nest that's too low that, that they'll come up and, and eat, uh, the deer will eat eggs and young out of the nest. Um, squirrels will climb trees into the nest and, and take eggs uh, or young. Not necessarily a main part of their diet, but it's, it's certainly a source of protein for them. So chickadees are cool. Um, and chickadees, I kind of have this love-hate relationship with them. And if you've read the book or if you plan to read my book, I'll, you'll, you'll read more about that. But I'll just give you a little preview. The chickadee is this scrappy bird. So it's norm, right? It's happy, everybody loves the chickadee until you get it in your hand. If you're a bird bander like I have been for almost 40 years now, or actually more than 40 years, um, you get that chickadee in your hand and man, does that thing fight. It twists and it turns. It takes that little powerful seed crunching bill and it gets under your fingernail bed or in the cuticles and oh, and it pinches a little bit of skin, that little tiny bit, man, does that hurt. And I've had so many blood blisters from chickadees pinching my skin. And they're the pow most powerful little bird. If I come back in, in another life, maybe I'll be a chickadee because they are just, they're scrappy things. Um, and when I was a young ornithologist and um, I'd be working with my mentors or, or these senior birders, it seemed like there was two generations of birders. There was me, the young guy from much of my life, you know, anywhere from 10 when I started up until, you know, I was in my probably mid twenties. And then all these guys that are in their fifties and sixties feel like are really old, right? Like I am now. And they would say, hey, Rich, there's a chickadee in the net. Go get that chickadee out. And I knew that it was gonna pinch me and it was gonna hurt, but I'm holding this wild bird. How cool is that? It is the most amazing thing ever. So I did that and I got to a point in my life. Now I'm, I'm older, I'm in my fifties and, and I've done band, you know, banding programs where I've said to somebody like, hey, go get that chickadee. I've trained them how to do it. And I realized I had this epiphany a while ago, a number of years ago. This form in, in our ornithology, we have a form of hazing, ornithological hazing. And that's go get the chickadee. Whoever gets a chickadee, they're the one being hazed. Anyway, but chickadees are pretty darn cool. I really like them. And I could talk, I could do a whole lecture on chickadees. And, and you, I'd like to think you guys would be entertained. And I would certainly love to do that. But we'll do that another time, perhaps. So Don and Kyle and I are going around the uh, scudic area and we're birding and birds are trickling and we find all the common sea ducks you expect. Things like bufflehead and, and common merganser and golden, uh, common golden eye. Um, so we're finding good birds. We had a few surprise birds, not, not too big of surprise. Um, we saw a common grackle and common grackle in the summer for you guys over in Blue Hill, anywhere in Maine, that's a bird you expect to find. Anywhere you've got a bit of a wetland, you're gonna find grackles. Um, but we were using eBird to track our birds and eBird said common grackles, unusual for this time of year. So we had to put in more details, put in photos of it. Um, and, and so that, you know, that was probably our one bird that was unexpected, although I always find it, almost always find it on the Scooty Christmas bird count. So maybe it's unexpected in much of Maine, but for some reason, Winter Harbor, they like to hang out there. Um, we found, you know, I'm gonna share my screen and share a couple of pictures of birds here. So let's see, share a screen and share my presentation. And let's just go up to some of the birds. There we go, let's start with this one. And okay, so another good bird we found was a glaucus gull. And glaucus gulls are referred to as white wing gulls. And think about the seagulls. A lot of you might not know individual species of gulls, but you think about, you know, you, you say, oh, we saw a seagull down you know, the harbor. And the bird that most people refer to as the seagull is the herring gull. It looks an awful lot like what you're looking at here, but the differences are, and see my mouse pointer, I'm pointing at the wingtips. Look at the wingtips here, they're all pale. There's no black. Next time, tomorrow, or next time you're out and seeing gulls, look at the wingtips. And I can almost guarantee if you're in Maine and you're seeing gulls now, they're gonna have black wingtips. A big chunk of the wingtip will be black. Oh, there we go, like that. Um, and 
that black means it's probably a herring gull. It could be a ring-billed gull. They're a little smaller, but, but they have black wingtips. Otherwise, it's pretty similar to this bird. So the white-winged gulls are a northern bird. You find these breeding up in the edge of the pack ice, um, up in the Arctic, and they come here for the winter. And there was a time, some of you probably remember that old uh, fish processing plant in Korea, the Stinson plant that used to have that huge uh, um, plywood guy that was holding the lobster trap. Was he holding a lobster trap? No, he was holding a, the Stinson sardine can. And, uh, and we, I would go there when it was still a fish processing plant and we would find 20, 30, 40 of the white winged gulls. It was so exciting. But the plant closed in 2010 and it was the last fish processing plant, uh, fish canning plant in Maine. And with the closing of that plant and the closing uh, and the kind of elimination of the offal that was being some of it making its way into the bay there, these, these birds that like to eat fish and they're not, they're, these guys are not dumpster ducks. These guys are, they're definitely more of a true seagull and they're just not around as much. We do find them in small numbers uh, in the coast of Maine, but not like we used to. You know, if we could have all come back, been here in the 1940s or 50s when there was all kinds of fish processing plants, we would have seen hundreds of these gulls in the coast of Maine. Now I'm really excited to see one or two a winter. So we saw that. Oh, here's the, the, the common grackle I already talked about. And I love grackles. I mean, just look at this. You know, you think of it as a black bird, and it is in the black bird family, but look at that iridescent sheen on its head and that bright contrasting eye. Um, and these birds are just, they're just really stunning in a, in a maybe underwhelming sort of way, but that, that iridescence is not something that you see in nature outside of birds. So it's really wonderful to, to, to see that. And another lecture I do when I teach ornithology, we do a whole lecture on just color in birds, color and iridescence and, and how, how they get iridescence and why they get iridescence. And, um, I don't, I actually don't think I went into that too much in my book, but come on one of my bird tours sometime. We can talk about that. Oh, got ahead of myself. Okay, let's, let's stop the show there for a few minutes. Um, so, so I was going along birding and, and oh, that day, so, so the New Year's Day, we had a few other good birds. We had harlequin ducks um, and harlequin ducks are just, to me, one of the most stunning ducks we have here in Maine. And this duck is, I, it's, it's the whitewater duck. When you find them during the winter, they're often feeding in the surf. Look where the crashing surf is on a rocky shore, especially on a Southern peninsula. That's where you're gonna find this, the harlequin ducks. And these ducks get battered and bruised and broken on the surf. The eiders will be feeding just outside the surf zone in the calmer water, but the harlequins are going right into the surf with crashing waves and they're diving and feeding. And we know they're getting battered and broken because when we find harlequin ducks that have been injured or even killed, uh, find them dead, we sometimes take them to, to vet clinics and do x-rays and they've got healed broken bones. It is rare to find a harlequin duck that doesn't have broken bones and been healed. Um, so they're being battered against these rocks. They're diving to feed on mussels and urchins and somehow they're surviving. Um, I don't know what the mortality rate is for them, but it's, it's just fascinating. They've found this niche. Not other ducks feeding in this surf zone, so we're gonna feed in it. Um, what else do we find? Those were highlights. We found the you know, pine grosbeak, which is a northern finch. That there's a small number of them breeding in northern Maine, but they mostly breed further north, like in Quebec and Labrador, and they're coming here for the winter. In fact, I know that some people reported to me they saw pine grosbeaks in your um, in that central green in downtown Blue Hill just was it yesterday or day before I forget. But um, where you find fruiting trees, things like crab apples or pin cherries that still have their fruit in the winter, keep an eye on it. Uh, keep an eye on them. You might find um, your, the pine gross beaks or even bohemian waxwings feeding in the, that fruit. Um, so we had a good day. By the end of the day, we had 41 species of birds. So that was, we were pretty darn pleased with that. That was a good, good day of birding for January, early January, uh, for early January. When I had set my number, my goal of 225 species, I set a secondary goal that I wanted to see 100 species before my first warbler. 
we do get a few winter harder winter hardy warblers that occasionally show up um, and that winter when i was doing my little big year didn't see any warblers until april um, so I, birds are trickling in um, no rare birds but you know lots of you know i was looking at my list what birds should i chase that winter is the best time to find them things like bohemian waxwing um, the common red pole hoary red pole um, so a lot of these winter birds and on March 9th, I got my hundredth species with a common myrrh and I got an airy cove over on the Scudic Peninsula. So I live in Bar Harbor. I've made it, you know, you can tell actually, um, so March 9th, that was at least a second trip, but I actually did three trips by that point to, to Scudic Peninsula. So I'm doing a bit of driving. I've been over to Blue Hill. I've been, uh, I'm trying to think where else did I go? I was over in Orland. So I've you know, been driving a lot, driving all over MDI to go birding. Um, then let's go back to my presentation for a minute. Share again. And share that. And so on April 13th, I finally found my first warbler. And it was this guy here. Some of you know what this is, but this is a palm warbler. And uh, palm warblers, we've always thought, well, up until 1934, I think, we always thought was a northern, very northern warbler. Nobody had ever found, before 1934, nobody had ever found a nest of a palm warbler. We just knew they went north. They kind of pass through Maine in migration, and then they're gone and they, in the spring. And then in the fall, they pass through again, and then they're gone. So where the heck do these things go? And, so we always assumed the Arctic or maybe even the subarctic place where there's not roads to get to. And in 1934, there was a gentleman, James Bond, and not the secret agent, but the actual ornithologist um, was out doing, he had a, what I call the triangular trade of birding. He spent part of his year in the Philadelphia area where he was a curator of ornithology for the, uh, the Museum of Science there. He spent part of his year in, the West Indies where he did bird research. And he spent his springs here on MDI, mostly in the Northeast Harbor area where he had a place and, and studied the, the, the um, breeding season birds here. So he was um, tromping through the brush in Acadia National Park to Great Heath, which is a big 500 acre pattern peatland bog. And he was studying there and James Bond had this amazing, amazing ability to go somewhere and just sit and plant himself for the long time for, for not just five, 10, 15 minutes, but for hours. And it's just sit and look and listen. And he was really observant like, okay, that bird that keeps going to that tree, that Northern Perula keeps going to that tree. And there's clumps of old man beard in there. He's going to this, it's going to this clump of old man's beard. That must be a nest in there. He'd walk over and kind of pry it apart. There's a nest. And oh, there's a bird going into this spruce here and it go, keeps going back there carrying food and he'd go look and he'd find the nest of the black pole warbler. We saw the, the palm warbler going to the base of a, a black spruce on the bog mat and kept going back with food and realized there must be a nest there so he got closer and closer and he finally found the first confirmed nest of a palm warbler not just in the United States but anywhere and here it was on MDI and so he learned that you know these guys nest on on um, um, peat bogs. So that was a really cool thing. So we, we do see them here. We see them, especially in the spring. They're one of the early migrants to come, uh, warbler migrants to come through. And so that was, that was pretty cool. That was my, um, uh, let's see what, I don't remember what number that was, but it was not my hundredth bird. It was, it was a, you know, a month after I found my hundredth species. So the numbers have been creeping up and um, you know, just kept looking for birds. By, by June 10th, I finally found, I hit my goal of 225 species. Um, I saw one of our viewers here is uh, a board member of the Great Pond Mount Wildlands. This is a place that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So remember this, some of you know where this is. It's near, or it's in Orland. It's an amazing place, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. I thought I had a picture of the Eastern Whippoorwill. So I'll pause that picture, the slide just for a minute. So on June 10th, I got Eastern Whippoorwill. 
And on June 11th, I was about to head out. I was going to catch a plane with my family for a two week trip. We were off on a trip. Some of you guys might be fans of that old radio show, A Prairie Home Companion. And for 15 years, Garrison Keeler would hire my wife and me to be naturalists on these cruise ships he'd charter. And we would do all kinds of programming. So, so um, on June 10th, it was my last full day in Maine for two weeks. And I'd, I was leaving during, during a critical time of migration and bird mating season. And there had been a rare bird reported in um, the Great Pond Mountain Wildlands. And it was a bird called uh, uh, Chuck Will's Widow. And it's in, it's in the nightjar family. And nightjars are called that. They're also called goat suckers. Um, actually, the goat sucker name is kind of funny. Um, back in the, probably in medieval times, if not before, these goat suckers or nightjars, this family of birds, um, they're insect eaters and they're nocturnal or kind of crepuscular more and into the early hours of the night. Um, but they would go and fly around where there's concentration of insects and eat them. And before the advent of insecticides and pesticides, where did you get concentration of insects? You'd get them where there was farm animals, often in you know, barns or corrals. So the farmer might be out there going to milk, do the nighttime milking, and this bird flies by under the cow or under the goat. And, and uh, while you're in there milking and flies underneath, and they would think that the bird is going there to suck milk out of the teeth of the animal. And of course they weren't. It's just, this happened to be an area where there's less fur, the, the insects, the biting insects are drawn to the heat. And so they're going there and your hands are there. And so, so they're going to the heat. And so the bird's coming in to get the insects. So that's how they got the name goat sucker. Uh, at least that's the, what most people accept as the source of the name. Um, so this, this Chuck Will's widow, which is rare in Maine, there's only been something like 17 of them ever reported in Maine. And the first one wasn't reported until 1974 by this guy, Will Russell, it was reported here in Bar Harbor, actually. Anyway, um, Sherry Domina had reported one on, on the, um, the Valley Road in, in the Great Pond Mountains Wildland. She was out doing a night jar survey. And I'm thinking, okay, this bird is there and I've got to go see it or else I'm not going to get it for my, my little big ear because I'm going to be gone for two weeks. And this is a rare bird. So this is kind of like, it's, it's a go now or don't go. But of course, like I said, it's on the eve of my departure. So I told my family, I'm, I'm off to go birding. I'm going on a birding adventure. And where the, the bird was seen was about, uh, about halfway, right in the middle. So like, if you look, I think you can see my mouse. So down here, I parked down here at the South Gate and it was seen right up, kind of actually right in this area here, uh, right in the middle of hot, the Hot Hole Valley parcel. So I brought my bike and uh, brought a headlamp and biked in in the dark. And, um, and pretty quickly, I was just like, I left the sound of the road behind, of Route 1 behind, and I was in my element. I just, I love adventure. I love being out when there's, uh, being away from human sounds. And I stopped at one point and just listened. And I was like, oh my God, it is so quiet. Um, but quiet in the way of the absence of human noise, not quiet as in the absence of sound. And, and I realized there's a, a viri doing its veer, veer, veer song. And there's the hermit thrush doing its you know, very ethereal sound. And there's the, you know, this lone black-throated green warbler doing its um, kind of uh, old and um, zee, 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 zee song. So there's a lot of birds doing their, their songs. As the sun's setting, it's getting dark. It's, you know, it's getting black uh, out. I was glad to have my headlamp and the night sounds start to go away. I heard the, the, the toot, 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 the backup beeper call of the Northern Sowet Owl. Get back on my bike and I'm biking. I know I've got the GPS coordinates for where this bird was found and I'm biking in. And, and uh, sometimes when you're kind of in a, in a zone, I like, if, if you do any, kind of activity where you're you know, like doing it for a long time, you get in the zone, whether it's running or paddling or cross country skiing. And you're just, I'm just biking, I'm going and in the dark and it's quiet. And you're just, I've got this little narrow field of view of my headlamp and, and I biked, uh, I wasn't quite to the coordinates for the Chuck Will's widow. And then I, the sound started to penetrate my, my psyche. And I'm hearing this sound very distant at first, kind of, Chuck Will's widow, Chuck Will's widow. And it got louder and louder. Chuck Will's widow. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, there it is. It's saying its name. Um, 
And I never saw it. I have seen them in my life. And in birding, one of the things I love about birding is there's no rules, they're just guidelines. And some birders will say, if you can positively identify the bird, you can count it. It doesn't matter if you saw it or heard it. Chuck Will's widow, there's nothing that sounds like it except a Chuck Will's widow. So I heard it, I'm happy, I, I heard it, I'm, I'm very content. I don't wanna go disturb it. I'm not gonna chase it in the woods with my headlamp and flush it. This bird's singing away because it's trying to attract a mate. Little does it know, it's probably the only Chuck Will's widow in 200 miles. Um, but it's sitting there trying and it's just singing its heart out. And so I've listened and I'm happy and, and, and so got that. That was, um, I'm gonna pause that just for a minute. Remember when I said I got to two species 225? I was trying to think what is a good number to go for after that? Is, two, is it 240? Is it 250? Well, I settled on 250. So I got Chuck Will's Widow, and that was 249. And I go a little bit further, and I knew there was this wet, um, this grassy area, and I stopped there, and, and I start hearing Whipper Will, Whipper Will, which is another night jar, the Eastern Whipper Will. And so that was my species, 250. So here I am on June 10th. I'm sorry, on uh, that was August, wait. Yeah, June 10th. Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm confusing some numbers here. 224 was the Chuckles Widow. Sorry, I mixed that up. I'm looking at my notes here. And the Easter Whipper Will was number 225. So that's when I said, what do I do now? I've got nearly six months ahead of me. What's reasonable to go for? And so I, I settled on 250, as I said. And so biked home, I get home. And it's after midnight, crawl in bed, and my wife kind of, she wakes up and goes over and, did you get it? Yes, I got it. So she knew that I was happy. And, and then the next day, we got a very early start to go to the airport, and I was gone for two weeks. Um, so, you know, the birds keep trickling in. Oh, by the way, there's your Chuck Will's widow. This is a really cryptic bird. If it's sitting on a branch during the daytime, it'd be really easy to overlook it. You know, just, it's not moving, it just hunkered down. So I'm going to pause and some bird for a minute. So I, I, I really love adventure. And one time when I was on one of the trips with Garrison Keeler and he introduced us, my wife and me on stage, and he, and he said that I, my, my wife and I were these modern day adventurers because you know, we just like going on big kayak trips. Our longest trip was five months. You know, we got to the point where a month long kayak trip seemed kind of short. Um, we've spent six months exploring and camping in Newfoundland. We've done some pretty major trips. But for me, adventure has always been part of my life. Since I was a little kid, I dreamed of being Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, and where I grew up in Western New York, we had this hill next to us and it would freeze over and there'd be ice. And, and my brothers and I would take uh, our screwdrivers, you know, we'll raid my father's workbench, take screwdrivers and, and claw hammers. And those were our ice tools to climb this icy mountain next to us. You know, little, you know, eight, 10, 12 year old kids climbing the mountains, being Shackleton or, we were Sir John Franklin exploring the Arctic. And we seem to always choose these, these expeditions that were winter or wintry conditions and often ill-fated. Um, we were also, you know, Sir Edmund Hillary and, and Tenzing Norgay climbing Mount Everest. We loved the expeditions. I always dreamed of expeditioning. And so I kind of, you know, kind of did that with my little big year. It was, it was a full, I think it was kind of a form of a project. And in fact, I was talking uh, one point after I published my book, talking to Kristen Lindquist, so uh, who's on today. So Kristen, your ears are ringing now. Uh, this is why. But um, Kristen was saying, Rich, you didn't just do one, write a book. You did two big projects. You, you did the little big year. You spent a year birding. Then you wrote this book. I'm like, no wonder why it felt like such a huge undertaking, because it was really, it was a big project. And so I did kind of a, a year of birding expedition here in Hancock County. And, and so I got my roots in birding. I was about 10 years old. And this guy here, this is a much more recent photo of him, but this is Jerry Farrell. When he was much younger and probably I'm gonna guess in his thirties and I was in my, you know, I was about 10 years old and he knocked on the door of our house. Our house was on the Niagara River in Western New York. And he asked for my father. And so I went and ran, got my dad and Jerry was wearing his uniform because he was a biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. 
And he said, you know, Mr. McDonald, I'm Jerry Farrell. And were you aware that where your house is situated on the Niagara River is a good spot for ducks to congregate in the winter? And my father had no idea. Jerry said, would you mind if I set up some traps to catch ducks and ban them to study migration? And my father said, sure, that'd be fine on one condition that if any of my boys want to help you, that they can. And Jerry said, absolutely. So I was about 10 and I'm like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And Rob, my next brother, was about eight. And so he did that. And we did that right through high school. We would go in the fall and, and spring migration. Um, and it was a pretty long season. We would go down to the, uh, before school and on weekend day mornings, go down and help Jerry ban birds. And I learned a lot of important life lessons with Jerry. I was a little kid. I was shy. Anybody, any of you that know me knows that I'm not shy anymore. But um, I was definitely a shy kid. And pretty regularly, Jerry would bring people, guests to come join him to see what he's doing. And after Rob and I were pretty well trained and well versed in what we were doing, Jerry would take turns pointing to either Rob or me to have us uh, explain what we were doing. So here I'm, I might be holding you know, a, common, a common golden eye. And so I would explain, you know, this is how we put the band on. This is why we're doing it, to study population. And, and this is how with the measurements we make, we always separate the, the feathers and the belly to look at fat. Or we take a special caliper to measure the wing cord from the shoulder, the, when the wing's kind of like this, right? From the, the shoulder of the wing to the tip of the wing to measure the length of the wing. And, um, and, and once in a while, he would be doing projects where we'd have to draw blood to do various studies of blood. Um, so we've explained this to whoever, whichever guest we came. And one day, Jerry brought this girl, and I was probably probably about 14 then. And, and I was at an age where I had discovered girls. Of course, it took another five or so years before they discovered me. But um, he brought Lisa Farrell, who was my age, and all the, all the boys in my grade had declared Lisa to be the most beautiful girl in our, in our grade. And she was captain of the soccer team, and she was one of the best students in the class. And, and I was just I could, somebody I could never talk to. And Jerry knew the score. He knew I'm nervous. He knew that his, his niece was popular. So he said, Rich, it's your turn to teach us what we're doing. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. It's Lisa. But I just put my head down, didn't look at her and explain what we're doing and taking the birds, not looking at her at all and explained. And that was that. And I did it and I succeeded. I didn't, I didn't you know, kind of stutter too bad. And then that morning after banding, I, you know, I'm in school now and I'm at my locker with my, my buddies and Lisa walks by and taps me on the shoulder. Hey, Rich, nice to see you. And she just kept walking. And all my friends like, oh my God, Rich, Lisa, you know, Lisa, she just touched you. I'm like, oh yeah, we're friends. And, uh, but the reality was we did become friends um, that the next year we were, we were science partners and, and Lisa, like, she's like, Rich, will you be my science partner? And she realized like I was a good student. She's a good student. She didn't want to be carrying somebody because she was a really good student. She knew that I was also really into science. And, and the life lesson I learned there was one, she was a normal person. And, and Lisa and I became friends. And, and I, I don't know how many times she would tell me about some boy she liked and she was nervous and didn't think he liked her. And, and I learned like she has the same fears as I do. She's just a normal person. So it was really good because if it hadn't been for Lisa, I might, who knows, maybe today I'd still be afraid to talk to half of you in the audience today. Like, but Lisa taught me like we're all, we're all, we all have the same fears and the same dreams. And so that was really a great life lesson. My mentor after college was this guy here, Mike Peterson. And uh, Mike was my mentor for 20 years and he was just an amazing man. And I learned so many things from him, but I'll share two anecdotes about Mike. Um, when I met Mike, I saw an ad in the Free Trader, which was this, I lived in the Adirondacks now, um, and it's this free paper, like when you're going to the grocery store and you're check, going, you know, you're walking out and there's little stacks of free classified newspapers there. It was one of those. And there was an ad, I, I always like to get it and just look through, what can I find? You know, maybe some tool that I need or who knows what, something that I don't know that I need, but it's just fun to look through. And, and there was an ad, wanted, warden for nature preserve must have pickup truck with trailer hitch and your own carpentry tools i'm like i've got a pickup truck it's an old beat up toyota pickup truck with a trailer hitch and i grew up you know, our family had a dairy so i've got lots of tools so i called up the number and said hi I'm, my name's rich i've got 
I've got a truck and I got the tools and I'm your guy. So that was it. I, he hired me there on the spot without even meeting me. And so we arranged that weekend. I met, picked him up at his house. We went to the boat launch. I picked up the boat, went to the boat launch. At the top of the boat launch, I parked the truck. I'm putting the drain plug and undoing the straps and doing all the things you have to do when you're launching a motorboat. And we're going out in Lake Champlain to do um, bird studies at the Four Brothers Islands Preserve. And this big old bellied uh, fisherman waddles up to me and he's, um, and he says, hope you're going out there to kill those goddamn birds. I had no idea what he was talking about. But here I am, this 22 year old kid and I am really intimidated by this guy. Um, so, I, you know, he wanders up, off and I said to Mike, like, what was that all about? Like, oh yeah, he hates cormorants. Like, why? He said, oh, they're a fish eating bird. I still didn't understand it, but I did come to understand it. And I'm one of those guys or one of those people, don't tell me I can't do something because I'll do it. Don't say something's bad because I'll think it's good. So this guy didn't like cormorants. Well, dang it, I like cormorants now. I didn't even care about cormorants before that, but now I like them. And I spent the next 12 years studying cormorants, um, did a lot of research on it, wrote papers about it and, and presented about it and, um, and learned all kinds of good stuff about it and had more than one run-in with fishermen over the years. And, but, but I learned that cormorants are not this villain purely from an ecological standpoint. Um, and I do talk about it in the book and I'm happy to talk about it in great length in person at some time. But cormorants ecologically are not a problem that we think they are. Um, the science is pretty clear in that. Um, so, so Mike, that was, you know, that was my introduction to Mike and cormorants. And Mike over the years taught me many lessons. I'm gonna just turn here. So Mike said, uh, there's two, two lessons in particular that he taught me. He said, when dealing with the press or with kids, speak in sound bites. And I, I miss like the old Audubon magazine back in the day when it was really thick and full of these really lengthy articles. Um, yeah, so many, so many magazines now have gotten really short articles and our attention span, maybe not all of you guys because you're library patrons, but so many people's attention span has gotten short and the media has reflects that. Um, so he said, speak in sound bites. And the other one he said was always make sure your fingernails are well groomed. That seems kind of funny, but I'm a birder, and I'm a bander, I'm holding a bird, it's in my hands. And if the media is there, or if I'm taking a picture of a bird to go and in some article or in a slideshow, you want fingernails that look pretty darn good. You don't want some ratty things. So those are the life lessons that Mike taught me. Um, so there was a lot of, lot of highlights in the year. Um, finding a, uh, a thick-billed myrrh was definitely a highlight. This is a, an alcid in the member of the alcidae. It's a cousin of the puffin. And this is the bird that they breed much further north in Canada, um, but we do find them with, with effort, you can find them in the winter here on the coast of Maine. So I just love anything that's north, I love. I love alcids. I, I lo puffins are cool and we lo everybody loves puffins, but they're not my favorite bird just because they get so much hype. And, and so when everybody says they're so great, I'm, they're, they're, like, they're not my favorite bird, but razor bills are cool, uh, murs are cool. Dove key, this little tiny alcid are really cool. Um, my first dove key I ever saw, Natalie, my wife and I were on sabbatical in Newfoundland and we were driving down the Bonavista Causeway and there's water on either side and the wind was blowing a gale. And I realized there wasn't just spindrift going across the road. These were birds being blown by this little gale like wind. And there's a car, we're driving and the car in front of us and us following. And this one of these little birds hit the car, tumbled through the air and landed in the ground. And I've dealt with a lot of injured birds in my life. So I stopped the truck and hop right out and go to grab this bird. It was a Wait dove a minute, Can you come help me? What's that? Oh, um, so the dove key was there. In my, I had the dove key in my hand, like, oh my God, it's a dove key. My first I've ever seen. And it's got a compound fracture in the wing bone, the kind of the upper wing bone. It's a bone sticking out through the skin. And I'm like, you know what? We're in Newfoundland. And here, but like the nearest potential uh, help for it is going to be in St. John's, which is several hours away. And there's just no way I can get it there. It's, this, this thing's going to die of shock. And so it's 
broke my heart, but I said, this thing's going to die. There's nothing I can do about it. So I can either leave it here to die. I can throw it in the water to die, or I can speed along its death. And I opted for the last option and then put it back in the ocean figuring something's going to eat it. So, so my first dove key was also a sad story, but it was my first one. And then during my, and I've seen many since then, but to see them in you know, my, my little big ear was pretty darn cool. I love going offshore. In fact, um, uh, maybe I'll read another passage here. This was from one of my, if I had to pick three favorite days of birding for the year, I don't think I could pick one, but I could pick three. The Great Pond Mountain Wildlands, Wildlands nighttime bike ride, I told you about that would be one. And I had two adventures on the College of Atlantic's uh, research vessel, the Osprey. And I just love being on boats offshore to go birding. So, so it's Sunday, June 10th, and, and I'm, uh, this is what I wrote here. This may just wind up being the best birding trip of the year, not for the variety and not for the fact of the privilege of experiencing a bird rare in Maine. No, it was for the sheer adventure of it. It was invigorating to arrive in, at the Southgate trailhead to the, oops, sorry, wrong. I read, did I read that one? No, I, that was, I talked about that venture. I pulled the wrong one out. Sorry about that, guys. Um, and I don't know where. I think it was, give me a chance to pull up the book here. Just take a second. I'll just share comments while you're looking, Great. Rich, that uh, when you were talking about chickadees earlier, Gabrielle said she'd love to hear more in depth about chickadees. So maybe we'll have you back <laughs> sometime for a full chickadee lecture. There we go. And, and there's uh, a lot of chickadees in the world. Yeah. Um, and Kate said, uh, I believe that Tom Brown, the tracker, called the chickadee the optimist of the winter forest. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's Bob a, said that's he a... loves the cheers analogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll start, just, I'll just read a couple paragraphs here just to give you a sense of this day. So this is uh, July 19th. College of the Atlantic's Dr. Sean Todd, uh, Stephen K. Katona Chair in Marine Sciences and Director of Allied Whale had requested my pair of eyes on their team of observers conducting whale surveys. To sweeten the deal, he dangled the carrot of encouraging me to multitask by conducting seabird surveys at the same time. Distribution sea of seabirds is among the most poorly understood of any order of birds. So anytime I am on a boat, I undertake surveys, counting the birds in a methodical manner. And the best way to aggregate and share this data is through the citizen science eBird portal. So go on a boat ride offshore all day? You betcha. Well, today was that day. At 8.17 AM, the lines were cast and we set off on College of the Atlantic's 46 foot research support vessel MV Osprey. First stop, Mount Desert Rock, 25 nautical miles south of the college's campus, out in the open Gulf of Maine. The college acquired the three acre island and all the facilities, a 75 foot lighthouse, a light keeper's house and a boathouse from the US Coast Guard in 1996. This is now the base for the College of the Atlantic's offshore marine operations. Um, and we'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, mostly we were seeing herring gulls along with some great blackback gulls during the 15 minute survey midway on our trip to the rock an immature Northern Gannet breezed by. Well, not a new species for my little big ear. They are among my favorite birds. Uh, gannets are gulls and gannets and gulls are large birds with wingspans in excess of four feet. I had to remind myself to recalibrate, recalibrate my observations to take in smaller birds. Think swallow size. When I did, I saw a small black bird. Its erratic flight must surely be the avian equivalent, avian equivalent of dancing. Wilson storm petrels are one of the tube noses. This is not a true family of birds. Rather, it is an assemblage of birds among a number of families, all sharing a particular physiological adaptation to their marine environment a large nostril-like conduit atop their bills that is less an olfactory organ and more part of their salt regulation system. 
So it just gives you a flare of some of the birds we were seeing and some of the kind of the, the experience we had out in the boat. But that day, um, in fact, let me just pull, go to the end of that chapter and I'll read off the list of birds from that day because it was just an amazing day. So in the order that I identified them as year birds, Wilson storm petrel, great shearwater, sooty shearwater, leeches storm petrel, redneck phalarope, Cory shearwater, Manx shearwater, Palmer and Jaeger, parasitic Jaeger, and northern fulmar. So that was like nearly a complete home run of all the seabirds you would expect to see offshore. There was only a couple that I was missing, and I did get, uh, in fact, I think there were only three that I was missing, and I got two of them later and before the year was over. Um, and the, the rare bird I ended up getting was the students at Mount Desert Rock had one of them had sent me an email with a picture of a funny looking sparrow and it was a lark sparrow. This is a southwestern sparrow and they seem to show up on offshore islands on the coast of Maine uh, later in the summer and early fall. So this one was hanging out for about a month on Mount Desert Rock. So I went there and found the student Nathan and excuse me and Nathan you know he, he knew I was on the boat and so he's like, Rich, it was just in the bush over here. So we went over and there was a stand of Rosa Ragosa. Um, and, and we stood there for about, a, about 30 seconds and this bird popped up. We looked around, had the nice kind of some, some nice coloring on it that we know positive, you know, identified as a lark sparrow and then it disappeared into the, the Rosa Ragosa again. Um, so it was a pretty cool bird. Uh, this bird here on this picture is the Northern Fulmar and Fulmars are just, I just love these birds. They're so cool. And if you look on the picture on the left, you can see this tube on top of the nose. That was that tube that I was talking about as part of their salt regulation system. This bird, some of you know, going back to, to highlight birds, some of you know this bird. This is a golden crowned kinglet. And it is a very common bird in Maine year round. I find, have them almost every day in my yard year round. Um, and this guy, you know, the, the crown here, you can see it. So I'm just pointing at my screen, but you can't see me pointing. Um, the crown here is just, you know, it's brilliant golden. And um, this is our smallest year round resident bird. And these things are cool because they like, the, during the night, during our cold winter nights, like actually, let's not think coast of Maine, we're pretty mild here. Let's go up to the county. It can be 40 below zero. How does this little bird, smaller than a chickadee, survive those nights? Well, they'll huddle tonight, uh, overnight in some cavity in a tree. And people have documented as many as 40 of them in there, all in there, all huddled, packed in there tighter than sardines and all shivering and shivering to generate heat. And as soon as the sun comes up, they leave that hole and they've got to go find food right away. Because you know, they're, like, they're on that narrow knife's edge of, uh, food means life, not finding food means death on a cold winter's night or winter's day. But these are wonderful little birds. And where the chickadees are really can be aggressive in the hand, these guys are just really gentle in the hand or out of the hand. They're just a wonderful little bird, sweet little sound. So you can go online and if you don't know their song, listen to their song, learn the song and walk anywhere there's a spruce woods, you're probably gonna hear these guys. Um, so my year, my year tip ticked along. Um, I got to, to, I mentioned my next goal was 250. I got to 250 on August 25th. My wife and daughter and I were on a sailboat with some, fr with some friends out in uh, Frenchman Bay. And as the sun was setting, one flew over the sailboat. So that was species 250. After that, I had no idea what to pick as the next goal. And I didn't, didn't set a goal after that. I just said, like, I'm gonna keep trying. And, so finally, as the year was going, this was my nemesis bird of the year, the boreal chickadee. I kept looking in places where you, you kind of hope to find boreal chickadees and never found one. And on December 30th, I decided to make one more trip up to Sun Caves Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, spent the day birding up there and tromping the woods. And it was a day kind of like, like today. It was cold, snow on the ground, but it'd been, there'd been a freezing rain. So it was all thick, crusty. It was one of those cross where you walk on it and, and occasionally you're, you break through, but the snowpack was really deep up there. It was knee deep. It was a miserable day to be walking in the woods, but spent the day up there. And eventually I, I heard this wheezy chickadee sound and 
I always think of boreal chickadees as a wheezy black cap chickadee. Um, so I heard it and I kept looking and looking. I didn't need to see it. I knew what it was, but I really wanted to see it. And I kept looking and looking and finally did find this pair of boreal chickadees. And I felt like that was a good way to end my year. I started with the black cap chickadee and I bookended it with the boreal chickadee. So that was, that was kind of my year of birding. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And, and I guess the last thing I want to say, and, and certainly have welcome any questions, but, um, and I've been talking for about an hour here, so I don't, I don't want to, to bore you guys all too much. But um, if you've read the book, you'll know this, or if you're going to read it, you'll find it out. But I'll, I'll give you a little, um, a little spoiler here. At the end of the book, as I'm kind of reflecting on my, my year, and I did, you know, among that reflections was just talking about um, some of the statistics, like how many miles did I walk? How many hours did I spend birding? And the one that really got to me was how many miles did I drive birding in one year in Hancock County? And I drove 6,390 miles. And I have to admit, I was kind of disturbed by how much I drove. Um, you know, if you, some of you are, I know are birders, maybe all of you are birders. But birders, we tend to think of ourselves as environmentally minded, if not outright environmentalists. I'm, I'm definitely a pretty ardent environmentalist. And when I realized how much I drove, like I go birding all the time. I'll hop in my car and go birding and don't think a thing about it. Because I just, you know, I'm just driving a few miles, right? But those few miles, those few tens of miles during the course of a year add up. And when I realized how much I drove, I thought about the carbon footprint. I was really not happy with that carbon footprint. And so I said, someday I'm going to do this little big year again. I'm going to do everything the same, except I'm not going to drive. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go and spend a year of birding by self-propelled means. So basically when I leave my back door, it means being on foot or on bike. Um, I'm in the process of contriving a trailer to hook to my bike to haul a canoe or a kayak. Um, I've got some hardware. I'm just, I'm just, uh, Yesterday I was building a bike uh, um, a ski rack to put on my bike so I can you know, plunk my skis in my bike rack, in my bike and go bike to a trailhead and go skiing in Acadia or maybe bike over to Orland and ski in Great Pine Mountain Wildlands to look for birds in the winter. So, so here we are, um, we're a month and a half into my zero carbon little big year. And um, I've seen 70, exactly 70 species so far. Where at this point, during my my full carbon big year, I had 87 species, so I'm not terribly far off, um, and and uh, I've already biked close to 400 miles. I've hiked just shy of 100 miles, so I've been getting out a lot, and and it feels really good to like think about how how many days in a row my car is in the parking lot. Unfortunately, I won't be going the whole year without driving because I do have to like go to school, pick up my daughter. And, and, you know, do have to go grocery shopping, but I'm not draw, I'm not no longer saying I'm going to go birding by car. I'm going to do some expedition biking. I'm going to bike to Sun Kays Meadows. It's going to take me two days to bike there, and I'll spend a week up there biking and camping, and I'll bike two days home. I'll do more trips to Scudic. I'll bike over to Blue Hill. Um, Blue Hill is definitely it's like when I go over to Blue Hill, I'll probably do that in the spring when I can go and camp somewhere because it's it's going to take me a day to bike there from Bar Harbor. So. You guys will see me over in the Blue Hill area. Um, and I always welcome people to join me, um, but it's, you know, it's really about trying to document the birds by, by not driving. So, I'll, um, so that's, kind of, that's kind of my current mission this year. During the time of a pandemic, my tour business is down. I'm not doing any international tours. This is a good year to do a zero carbon little big year. So I think with that, I've probably talked enough, but I've, if anybody has questions or comments or anecdotes you want to share, I certainly welcome any, anything anybody wants to say. Thank you, Rich. That was great. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to open things up for questions. Folks can feel free if you want to kind of raise your hand and you can unmute yourself or um, type questions into the chat and I'll read them out. We did have a question from Bob who said, uh, you mentioned Ernest Shackleton and Edmund Hillary as inspirations for adventures when you were a kid. Did you likewise seek to emulate James Bond, the ornithologist, not the secret agent, in your younger years? 
I have to admit that I didn't know who James Bond, other than the secret agent, was until I moved to MDI. Um, and since then, I've been really fascinated by him. And I just recently learned there's a new book out about James Bond, the ornithologist. I, have not, I haven't looked it up. The, I don't know the title yet, um, but I need to look that up and, and get that book. But uh, James Bond, the ornithologist, I mentioned his triangular trade. And at one point, uh, his, he was interviewed by Vanity Fair magazine. Uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, um, Ian Fleming was interviewed by, by Vanity Fair magazine and said, so how did you come about the name for your protagonist, James Bond? And Fleming said, you know, there was all these, these lead characters with ostentatious names, things like, you know, you know Prentice Carruthers III or something. And, and he, he said, I wanted a good working class name. And, he, and as, as, Bond, as, as uh, Fleming said, he was sitting in his kitchen in his breakfast nook in Kingston, Jamaica. And he saw a bird out his window and he wondered what the bird was reached down to grab his bird book. And as he's grabbing his bird book, he happened to look at the book and it was The Birds of the West Indies by James Bond. And he said, that's the name, I want James Bond. So he used from that, that was how he got the name for his protagonist. Um, James Bond, the ornithologist was probably the least um, uh, popular media oriented person of his day. And, and um, he, he didn't know who Ian Fleming was, didn't know about the, the, the books, which then were turned into movies, because this is, you know, now we're talking late 50s, early 60s. Fle uh, James Bond had no idea who all this was, but his wife did, and his wife was very intrigued. And so his wife started a correspondence with, with Ian Fleming. And in one letter, tongue in cheek, said, you know, I think that you owe us royalties for using my husband's name. And Fleming said, I'm just this poor author. I don't have any money to give you, but I can offer that if you ever want to use my name, you feel free to use my name any way you want. So that was kind of a little fun trivia, but I I've, I've, have met people over the years that, that did know James Bond. Um, um, James Bond mentored a local birder, Ralph um, uh, Bud Long, and, and uh, Bud Long, I also passed away before I moved here, but Bud Long, was a high school science teacher who taught science to some of my best friends here. And so, you know, I've heard all kinds of stories about Ralph, uh, James Bond and Bud Long. So there's definitely a interesting birding community here. Uh, Robin, did you have a question? I see you're unmuted. Did you wanna? Oh, no. no. Just thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank Just you. Check. Thank you. Hi, Robin, by the way. Robin <laughs> and her husband, Kurt, uh, regularly come on bird tours with me and so I love see I love seeing you here Robin and we had a uh, Gabrielle in the chat said that you're welcome to stay with them in East Blue Hill and she'll join you on her bike <laughs> great I would love that I I'm um yeah hopefully we can get to a point where you know we can actually you know get beyond the pandemic and maybe I can take you up or at least you know, camp out in your backyard or something Ken, did you want to ask a question? Feel free to unmute. Uh, you're you're muted at, right at the moment, but if you if you turn your mic on, I think you can. Speak uh, you, you showed a picture of the uh, palm warbler, which is one of the very first warblers to come up in, in migration, and you also should mention a hermit thrush, which is the first thrush to arrive, yeah. and the phoebe is the first flycatcher to arrive. All three twitch their tails. Yes. Is there any, but is there any reason that having to do with there being early arrivals? That's a good question. And there's also like the greater yellow legs does a variant to that. They do that kind of bobbing yeah. thing and some other birds do that too. There's been research on it. And there's been no, nothing definitive that I've come across. The, the, the general consensus, but not, not proven is that, that these are all insect eaters uh, or at least in part insect eaters and that um, and that the idea is that this, these birds, by twitching their tail, is trying to flush insects that they can then go after. But but that the, 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 but that the, they are early arrivals. Then that has nothing to do with that. That no, has, the, the, nothing I've to seen, do with they. It's too very cold, or they're trying to generate heat, or something like that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. And to be honest, I hadn't thought about that before. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I've not come across anything to tie that to arrival time. Yeah. It's just a coincidence. Anyway, this always puzzled me. Secondly, 
in your book, you saw a, uh, uh, in October, you saw a migrating thrush that you, in your description was that you essentially, as I understand it, you cannot distinguish or one cannot distinguish between a great cheek thrush and a big nose thrush. Yes. And I, I'm, I, 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 I sort of, I'm just puzzled because I, the last fall, for instance, in September in Hancock Point, I spent 20 minutes with a, with a thrush within 15 feet of me yeah. on a lawn, watching it very carefully and studying it and everything about the slightly reddishness of the tail, the warmer brown, the extremely gray face. It, it, I felt that, 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 that it was clear. And so, but, but, but you're suggesting that you really cannot distinguish between the two species. Is well, that correct? I would say there's two parts to that answer to your question. Um, I would agree with you. I, I was comfortable calling my bird a big nose thrush. Um, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Uh, a great cheek thrush. Great cheek, yes. Yep, I was comfortable calling it a great cheek thrush. And uh, I'm, uh, I use eBird religiously. I was actually one of the early beta testers in the early 2000s. And so I, you've been entering e uh, bird sightings in eBird for years. And up until recently, up, well, up until about 2000, up through much of 2017, if you entered that into eBird as a great cheek thrush, they would have accepted it, no questions asked, other than, you know, it's an unusual bird. You give your description you just gave and, and it's a great cheek thrush. Yeah. But um, eBird, their, their argument is that, that there's so much overlap between a great cheek thrush and a big nose thrush that short of having it in hand where you can make some measurements of which many of the measurements overlap yeah. uh, or short of hearing it, which is definitive, um, you can't tell it apart. Now, I agree with you. There, there are some specimens that you can tell apart. There are some you cannot, but eBird won't accept it short of, short of measurements that are definitive yeah. or an audio, they won't accept it as a great cheek thrush. Uh, unless you're up in, in Northern Labrador or on top of Whiteface yeah. Mountain, or somewhere where you know what it is, but during migration, they're saying it's a great cheek slash Bicknell's thrush. Yeah. So that's whereas why. Some, yeah. Whereas some spe on you know, there's obviously gradation. So some Bicknell's and great cheeks at the extremes may be clearly distinguishable, but there are others that are so close that you can't tell. Yes, and so the eBird is defaulting to short of the definitive uh, either audio or uh, or physical measurements short of that, yeah. they're not accepting anything as, um, as, as, as definitive species. Interesting. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I've enjoyed your, I enjoyed your book. Well, thank you. Anyone else have a, a question or thought they want to share? Kate? I have a question. Um, Rich, we have had for several winters, about once a week, we see a common flicker. And I noticed when, when I did the big, great backyard uh, bird count last week, that it was listed as, I think, rare. It was not on that first list. Yep. And um, is that fair? Is it rare or common? And, and what kind of environment does it like? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the the northern flicker is the, the, the current official name, but people call it common flicker, flicker, just flicker or yellow shafted flicker. But the flicker, it's a migratory woodpecker. And I would say the, the vast majority of them do leave the area. Um, but we're seeing with global warming that m a small but increasing number of them are overwintering in Maine. And so eBird, there's, if you've used, if for those of you that use eBird, uh, actually maybe for those of you that don't use eBird, it's this international database. Anybody can use it. Anybody can enter data. For, it's, there's no charge to use it. You post your, your, you enter your sightings and you enter what you know. If you don't know a bird, you don't have to enter it. But if you know, you know, it seems like everybody knows chickadee. You got chickadees at your feeder, go ahead and enter it into eBird. The flicker is, once you learn the telltale identification sign, that's this, you know, it's a woodpecker and it's got this white rump that's really obvious when you see it like, oh yeah, that's the flicker. It's the only woodpecker in Maine with a white rump. So, um, so eBird is part of its uh, kind of quality control. The very first thing you do is you enter your sightings and it looks during this range of dates, like during the great backyard bird count, which you just did, um, during this range of dates, flicker is very rare in Maine. 
So therefore we're gonna flag it. So if you report it, it's so rare that we want you to provide additional data. Um, if you, but if you see it in June, it's not, on, it's not rare, so there's no flagging. Um, so I, I think that we're going to come to a time, I don't know when, but at some point they will change the flag of that. They'll say, you know, if you see one flicker or two flickers, they're gonna start accepting it with no questions asked. But I, they're not there yet. They can change the flags. They can say during this range, it is acceptable. Right now they're still saying you need more data. And in the case of the flicker, I simply would like, when I see a flicker in the winter, I write a woodpecker with a white rump. I just conclusively verified that it was a wood, that it was a flicker. Um, so you'll get that at some point, but right now it's just because it's based on historical data. We don't have enough data to suggest it's common yet in the winter in Maine. But I, I have no problems believing that you saw it. And, and eBird doesn't really, they don't really doubt you. It's just, they're, they're looking at statistics. And statistics say it's rare enough that we want a little more verification. So do I have to give photo verification? I tried to make convincing remarks. Like I said, it's 12 feet away. We see it <laughs> at least once a week. <laughs> it's a male. Yeah, yeah. The marks are just fine. Um, but like what I do is, um, so here's my, you know, got my iPhone. If I'm outside and I carry my trusty notebook also, it's always, I have both with me. And so my notebook, my notebook is in the field. I'm writing down details. The phone, I'm doing the bird list real time. There's a flicker, click into eBird, you know, did that. I like doing it real time and, and the smartphone because it pops up right then. This is a rare bird. Then I know like, oh yeah, I gotta pay attention. The flicker is an easy one. I, you know, woodpecker with a white rump, that's all I need to write. But if, if I saw a, let's say a pine warbler, um, it's, it's a winter hardy bird. We do see some on occasion. But a pine warbler, how do I know it's a pine and not a yellow rumped or a, um, a palm warbler? There's some, there's some overlap depending on the plumage for those birds. So it's gonna flag me no matter which warbler, it's gonna flag it as rare. Now I need a much lengthier descri description, written description. Photos are great. If you can get a photo, um, you know, like depending on the bird, if you get a, a, a turkey vultures, they're the raptor that flies the wings up in this dihedral. So you get a photo of that turkey vulture. It might be a little thing, but when the wings are up, submit that photo, you just proved it's a turkey vulture. So photos are great. Don't have to be the high quality. It's, it's, if, if it's enough to identify the bird, great. Um, audio is great. A written description is great. So it's, it's really your comfort margin. Um, and if you think you can do, you can answer the question by writing it, that's great. I would say what you do want to do though is before you look up in the field guide to, con to like, you know, okay, you saw the flicker, you know what it is. Write down some notes in eBird. I knew it was a flicker because it was a woodpecker. Woodpeckers are, you know, as a family, pretty easy to identify and it had a white rump. But um, if you want to con con confirm that, then get your field guide. Don't write the description from the field guide, write the description from what you saw from your memory. That's why I carry my field notebook. Oh, it wants more details. I'm going to make a quick sketch. I'm going to write down some details about what I saw, so why I knew what it was. And then, you know, our memories all fade even quickly. I go home that night. I'm going to write up the description. Oh my gosh, what did I see? What did it did it have the striped striped chest or not? Um, so, so writing in a notebook at the time is really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other bird questions out there? Uh, I've got some folks in the chat saying just thank you and they've enjoyed the program. I wanna make sure everyone knows that um, we're, we're gonna be getting Rich's book into the library shortly, but it's also available, I believe at Blue Hill Books if you'd it like is. to support our local bookstore here. And it's mm -hmm. available at Blue Hill Books. And um, if you're over this way, it's at Sherman's, it's at the Wendell Gilly Museum. Um, I also have them and I'm selling them. You can reach out to me and the advantage of getting from me is uh, I, if you want, I'm happy to inscribe it. Um, I, I, I kind of do that automatically when I send them out, but I, I have a bunch here too. So, uh, but any of them, we love supporting the local bookstores. We love supporting the authors. So, um, and if you're really like, if you're somewhere far away and you want it and, and you, you know, 
I don't know, you, for whatever reason you're inclined, you're an Amazon shopper, you can get it on Amazon, but let's just support the Or I think a lot of our local bookstores are shipping, especially yeah. during pandemic times. So Absolutely. I know Blue Hill Books will mail it to you if you want to support that. <laughs> yep. I'm a big advocate of supporting local bookstores. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, if, if there's no other questions, I invite folks to unmute yourselves and just shout out your thanks to Rich. Thank you so lot. much. This thank was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Well, thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.